All right, so good evening or good afternoon. Um, this is Eunice with Florida Training Academy here in Jacksonville, Florida. And today I have a wonderful instructor named Chucks. Um, we're just gonna go ahead and do some instructor development. He is an experienced nurse, but we wanna make sure that before he goes out and teaches the public, that if he has any last questions that he can get those questions answered now. So um, Chucks, would you please introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Chucks. I'm a registered nurse. I have my master's in leadership. Uh, I've been a registered nurse for over um, uh, 13 years, um, working in ICU, working in, um, in MESO unit, and um, working, I've worked everywhere, you know, worked in very uh, well, big hospitals also. And at the same time, I'm now trying to do us have something on the side, uh, uh, side hustle. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, good to say. Uh, so uh, that's about it for me right now. You know? All right. Well, I um, I want to first of all thank you for your service because if you're out there, you know, during the pandemic, I am in education full time. I teach all the time, just CPR. So I train those who are out there on the front lines, but I'm not out there on the front lines. So I really thank you for your your commitment and your sacrifice to the community. And now you're taking it a step further, and you are a new American Heart Association instructor. So we're just going to go ahead and, and, and help you with whatever you need in order to go out there and train those nurses. Um, we have our AHA instructor manuals and also our provider manual. If you'll turn right. your instructor manual to the lesson plan for the initial course and at the very bottom of your lesson plans, it may be hard to see initially, but um, the initial course goes from page one to page 33. Okay, let me open it, initial course. And if you could just move your camera just a little bit so we can see your face. Oh, okay. Yeah. There we go. It? Yes, sir. And then let me know when you can see um, page 33 in your lesson plan. So lesson plans, page 33. Oh. I just sometimes, I'm sure it's there, we're just overlooking it, part 5A. And so in the lesson plan, this will be found after page 31. And what I need you to look Correct. at, what I'm trying to point out to you is at the very bottom, it That's says, it. That's yes, it. okay. If you could please put some type of separator between those two pages, because that's going to be very confusing. Whenever you play, press play on your DVD player, which we'll be doing soon, um, well, when you when you actually have your DVDs, if you bought the combo pack, you have a DVD for initial and then a, DV, a DVD for renewals, yes. they call them updates, or heart code. Right. So you have to use the portion of your lesson plan that corresponds to the video that you're going to be showing. Okay. Okay. And so if you're going to be showing the initial video, it's the first 31 pages. Okay. If you're going to be showing the renewal video, it's, it's the second segment of pages, the second section. Okay. Understood? So you got two sections in your lesson plan. What is a passing score for a student on the American Heart Association Basic Life Support Examination? 80%. Close. And so where you would find that at is in testing. So in your mm -hmm. lesson plan, mm -hmm. if you'll turn to testing. Okay. So in testing, not only does it show you the checklist that you will be utilizing whenever you're evaluating your um, basic life support students. It also talks about um, how to remediate a student in this section um, mm -hmm. and also those, those clinical um, components, but it's a 84% and 84% is passing. Okay. Okay. In the same testing section, Page 60, 60 in part four. Okay. 
Okay. Speaks about retesting students. And so your training center may have a policy that goes above and beyond what American Heart Association has. Um, I usually will allow a student to retest once um, during the class. So if they've scored less than 84%, um, they'll, they're, now, you, I'm telling you what we do, what your training center does could be different. Um, they get an opportunity to retest. If someone requires an oral examination because maybe they have dyslexia or English is their second language, if they require me to read the questions to them, that means that they're going to be the last student. And, and I will ask, is it okay if I read the test to you? Because a lot of adults are not going to admit that they have a, you know, any type of comprehension issues. But you're yeah. going to know that student because they can do the skills fine. And they can answer the questions fine until they have to read them. And now when it comes time to read in the actual questions, they missed 10 out of 25 questions. And that just didn't seem right because this person was able to call out all the answers previously whenever you ask the question. So that'd be a person who would I, I'd have to save to the end and read the questions to them to make sure that they and the answers and to see if they can pass that way. Okay. Our goal is to not, our goal is to not fail anybody. You know, our goal is to make sure, because if they're coming to you, they need their certifications, they need to seek employment. So we want to make sure that they pass, but we also want to make sure that if someone's just absolutely not able to understand the skills, unable to do the hands-on components that the American Heart Association requires, and then on top of that, they're unable to pass the multiple choice examination. That is somebody who is going to be a true remediator, and that's somebody who we allow them up to 30 days to go home, read their book. We don't charge them another fee. They can come back again and whatever part of the test that they were unable to pass, they're able to come back and remediate on that section. Um, right. For some people, it could be that, you know, if you have an older nurse, you know, we're going to age out at some point and we're not going to be able to do those chest compressions, but we can answer every <laughs> question. <laughs> <laughs> so it is probably going to be, hey, you know, Eunice, I do apologize. You were unable to, um, to perform the chest compressions at the appropriate rate or the appropriate depth. Would you like to come back and reschedule again on another day? These mm -hmm. are the dates that I have available. Um, and if someone, I've had a student who actually had a broken wrist and they were like, I'm going to attend the course. Well, you can attend the course. However, if you cannot perform compressions according to the American Heart Association standards, you cannot be issued a provider card. They, yeah. now, they now have an advisor card. And so whenever you're ordering cards from your training center, if someone cannot perform the compressions, they would not be a BLS provider. They'd have to get that other card, which is called the advisor card. Okay. Yeah. All right. So going back to our lesson plan, part five. Mm -hmm. And we're just going to go through this before we press play on the video. All right. So this is old school, 30 to 60 days before class, sending out emails and stuff. We're not doing that. <laughs> <All right. laughs> <laughs> at least three weeks before class. We're not doing that either. So I, I tend to schedule my classes a month in advance. And usually the last two weeks of each month is when the classes will have the most amount of students. So and that's going to be usually the trend is that the healthcare providers wait until the last minute to get certified. Mm -hmm. So um, make sure that you have your class limits um, that you're not allowing too many students in, especially when you initially start teaching. And the American Heart Association has a one to six ratio, one one instructor per six students. And I do apologize for the noise. I have my, my window open, getting some fresh air here. All right, so page two, please. Okay. So now we're talking about those room accommodations. And if I am going to be teaching a class at a someone else's location, I ask basic questions and they're gonna to fib to you and they're gonna say, yeah, we have a DVD that works. We have a remote control, the TV works and you get there and they don't have any of it. So, <laughs> so I am old school. I'm traveling around with, with cords and my computer. Um, I have not purchased the American Heart Association USB. 
um, I use DVD players. So um, what type of, how, what, what format did you purchase your course materials on for your video? I bought um, DVD um, okay. players. Yeah, yes. DVD. Yes, if you could, um, make sure if, if you don't already have that, that your DVD player has the HDMI cord, and that will help you a lot if you go and teach courses at um, corporations, because they're used to us being able to connect the laptop to their HDMI cord, and then it displays on their projector or on their huge TV. So oh, wow. in, in the very back of your DVD player, if it doesn't have the HDMI adapter, go ahead and purchase one in the future that does. Okay. Okay, that way when you get to those corporate classes, I don't care what they lie and say to you, you'll be prepared. All right, and so you want to make sure that the room is set up um, adequately, um, making sure that you know where the, the company's items are. Whenever mm -hmm. you're going to teach courses at a company, because I, I know that you're just starting off and you haven't even thought about that. But I want to have you think about that because they, they love you and your community. And the doctor's office is going to say, hey, Chucks, I need you to come teach BLS <laughs> here at the office. And you're going to be like, oh, my God, what do I do? Okay, what date? How many people? I need you to, um, you're going to send an invoice to them via one of the payment sources that we had already spoke of. You can send those invoices out to them. Um, I usually do not provide anyone. No one gets their cards until I get my payment. So I'll go out and I'll teach the course, but you don't get the roster. You don't get anything until we receive payment. That kind of keeps them motivated to pay you. They won't be slow. <laughs> but if you go out and you give those cards, you know, out before you receive payment, you're jeopardizing your business. All right, so when you're there, you want to know the date, the number of participants, how many of those participants do not speak English? Because if I don't speak that language, who's going to translate? And then technically they're not supposed to translate in the American Heart Association examination. I have to be the one who administers the examination. So that could be something that you may also want to, you know, really address before you go there. Okay. All right. Day of class, would you read the bottom of page two, please? Day of class, arrive at the course location in plenty of time to complete the following. Make sure that all equipment works and has been cleaned according to the manufacturer instructions. All right, so how do you clean? What are you gonna be cleaning your equipment with? Um, ah, all right, so it's a 10% bleach solution, just like in the hospitals. Get you a spray bottle, get you some bleach. Like in the interim, when I'm in the facility, I don't want to be spraying something that's so, that has a strong smell. So I may yeah. just use my Clorox wipes in the facility. But when I get home or when I get to the home office, that is when I'm really going to screw up them down and utilize what American Heart Association recommends or what the manufacturer says. And it's usually 10% bleach solution. If you put the bleach solution on and wipe it right off, not effective. Okay. okay. All right. If you'll continue reading. Okay. Um, have the video ready to play before students arrive. Distribute supplies to the students or set up supplies for students to collect when they arrive with clear with clear instructions on what they need all right so let's stop right there and i already saw your equipment great job um for because we've been doing this for a while every time when i initially started this when i made more money i invested that money and bought more equipment but i also have a standalone facility where i train out of and so our goal is to have one to one okay. one piece of equipment per student our classes get done a lot quicker. Our students, I just, I just feel like they're more comfortable. If you start having, because again, we said it's a, it's a one, um, one instructor per six students, but you mm. can also have three students per one mannequin. Yes. That means that your class is going to be longer. That means a lot of more hand sanitizer a lot of sanitization in between. So I just find it's just easier for me and my instructors if we have enough equipment for each one of our students to have their own. As far yeah. as the, um, the pocket mask, we do not allow our students to breathe into the mannequin. So I usually joke with them, especially during the pandemic. So I'll joke and we'll talk about the components of high quality CPR. 
And um, whenever we get to the actual rescue breaths, I say, repeat after me, I do not kiss my mannequins. And everybody kind of <laughs> jokes, but <laughs> don't kiss my mannequins. And it just depends on the area you're in. I know there are some instructors in our area and everyone's mm -hmm. still blowing into the mannequins. But mm -hmm. as a as a lifesaver, we are not putting our mouths on our patients. Right. We know that providing that high quality, those chest compressions and calling a cold, and when the cold team arrives, they're going to use the back mask devices. We know that that's how someone saves a life. We don't have to risk our lives by putting our mouth on someone else's mouth. So in our class, instead of us physically using the pocket mask and a one-way valve to give a breath, we will just demonstrate how to place it, how to use it, but then we verbalize the, the words breath and breath. Um, and then there's no equipment that we have right now that if you're utilizing your mouth, is going to prevent you from spreading COVID or contracting COVID. So um, I just don't want to take that risk and that liability, but you'll figure out what works for you and your community. Okay. So at each of our stations, because we're talking about the setup, at each of our stations, we have the adult mannequin. We have the pocket mask with the one-way valve that they'll use to simulate breaths. No one's truly breathing. We'll have the pen and we'll also have a piece of paper because they can take notes. What is the American Heart Association's policy on open notes and also resources during their, their class and their test? Mm. Mm. So mm. what part of your book do you think you would find that? I will find it in, in um, the lesson, in the teaching. Teaching, perfect. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And so this is whenever I have instructor classes here in Jacksonville, I tell them the truth. The instructor class does not prepare you how to be an instructor. The instructor class teaches you policies and procedures. It's not until you actually come in to be monitored and you have that ongoing mentorship where you actually learn what you're doing. So it is scary starting off as a new instructor yeah. because you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> You don't know what you don't know. Exactly. <laughs> All right. So, yes, in the teaching part, and so whenever you get opportunity, you want to go back in and you want to read um, the, the teaching part, part three of your instructor manual, because right. all those icons mean something. And whenever you're flowing through your lesson plan and you see those icons, it's really user-friendly. It kind of tells you what to do. There's an agenda here. And then I kind of forgot what my question was. Here, do you understand what a heart code course is? I do. Okay, what's a heart code course? Um, a heart code course is a course that you is for is for those that don't those that are not on healthcare. But so that's what I wanted to make sure of. You're talking about heart saver. And so there are American Heart Association and all their lingo. I want you to write these two terms down. Okay. Heart saver is the layperson version. So that'll be for your coaches, your educators. Heart code is blended learning. It's so... Blended. Blended learning, that means they have to pay for the online course through the American Heart Association. And the reason why I'm bringing that up is because someone may call you and say, hey, I, I just need a skills testing session. Okay. And if they need a skills testing session, that means that you need to ask them what skills testing session because they could have did hard code first aid, hard code pediatric first aid, hard code basic life support. You want to find out what hard code class they took and then I always require them to send me their certificate of completion before I ever schedule a class because some of these nurses will be very last minute. And they're thinking they can get it done. And now you're there at the office waiting for them to show up and they never show up because they never completed the hard code course. Um, how do you purchase your American Heart Association supplies, your eBooks that your students are going to need? It's through the training, training center. Okay. You can also go to the AHA's website directly, and that mm -hmm. is um, shopcpr.heart.org, shopcpr.org, 
shopcpr, excuse me, dot heart, dot org. Okay. Okay, and that's for all instructors and it's also okay. for students, okay? So heart code, your student calls you and they want a skill session. What must they send to you before you schedule that heart code skills testing session? The online. Online, online course. course. Students are going to try to be slick and it's going to say ABC CPR. Can you accept that? No, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And so that is that second DVD, the one that says um, renewal slash hard code. So you'll okay. know what DVD to play. And that lesson plan for hard code is also in the book. And mm -hmm. then one of the last things I want to cover before we go back to our lesson plan is do heart saver lay person students are they required to take a test at the end of their class no i don't think they're not no. do heart saver students have to feel for a pulse they have to they don't they do not imagine someone who is 17 working at crystals and they, they don't know anything about, you know, anatomy, physiology, about trying to feel for a pulse. They're going to delay starting CPR, trying to determine whether or not they feel a pulse or not, because they're not confident. So heart saver students are not required to feel for a pulse. What do they check for instead? Two things we check for is healthcare providers. So if they're not feeling for a pulse, what are they checking for? Breathing, that the person is breathing. Breathing. If the person's not breathing, they are to assume the person's in cardiac arrest, call for help and start CPR. And start CPR, yes. Yes, sir. So do not force your warehouse workers to take a multiple choice examination and to try okay. to feel for a carotid pulse. That is not part of their job. Okay. Okay. All right. So back to our lesson plan. We're on page three now. Okay. All right. So we've talked about the layout. You walk in, you're going to have your roster. Um, you can print out your paper roster um, from the instructor network, the portal. And if your training center has not um, gotten you access to the portal yet, once you get access to the portal, make it your business to understand where things are within that portal, because that's also how... Um, how you can get updates and you can also access the PAM, which is the program administration manual, is your AHA Bible. Okay. So, as far as page three, when it talks about the discussion, I always talk about the safety and the layout of the building, um, what is required in order for the students to receive their certification cards. They're gonna to have to be able to, um, to pass their, their skills. And that would be adult, child, infant, use of the AED, and also choking, helping a choking victim. And then they have to make a score of 84% or greater on their multiple choice examination. We issue our certification cards on the same day as successful course completion, but all cards are sent via email. So we have to make sure that we have captured our students' correct spelling of their name and their correct email address. If there's a mistake, we, um, our instructors have to eat that cost. And I'm not sure how your TC is, but we want to make sure that whenever you're capturing information, that you're capturing it correctly. Okay. Okay. Page four. At the very bottom, if you'll read that last bullet for me. Okay. And so if I could get you to please take out the... Um, page 53 which is the adult skills checklist and then find the infant checklist also if you want to take out the the critical skills descriptors you can because that's going to be very important for you as a new instructor um but right now we're going to whenever we do our demo class when you're teaching and and i'm going to be acting as your student um, if I do something incorrect, you would not check that box on the checklist. And you don't really want to write on these um, because mm -hmm. you can utilize these again, just make multiple copies, but you're going to pretend. And if I don't do something correct, I would not receive a check in that box. And then at the very bottom where it says test results, if there is anything that is unchecked, that means that I N R, I need remediation. Okay. I did not pass. Okay. Okay. What is the difference between feedback 
and debriefing. So think of after a code. And we, say, a code. we have to debrief. Yes. Yes. Brief, yes. So the debriefing is after, after your, um, after you do your scenario, your mega code testing scenario. Feedback is in real time. And that's important because if I am compressing on top of the xiphoid process, do not allow me to do three cycles of CPR with my hands in the wrong position. <laughs> you want to give that loving feedback while I'm practicing, okay? So Eunice, could you please move your hands into this location? Um, avoid the xiphoid process. Uh, we're about to have fun. It's about to get real. We're almost there. <laughs> Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. And our training center does not allow remote courses. Um, and the reason that we will, I can, I can offer remote courses because I am a training center faculty member and I am very specific about who I allow those remote courses to. Um, you want to really check the American Heart Association's um, PAM and contact your training center. Because there was an instructor recently who was really upset with me because I would not schedule uh, an instructor course. She didn't have any equipment. I'm not teaching you how to perform CPR on a teddy bear. Because according to the American Heart Association standards, our mannequins have to have the feedback devices, compression rate and compression depth. And right. so, so I don't teach remote courses. I am teaching them to you in case someone asks because you've already completed that process. I'm just adding on to what you already have, okay? Right. Okay, so page five. All right, page five. All right, so once you, you would show the actual entire segment, so it comes by the instructor tips, the icon with the rectangle, excuse me, with the triangle. So we're on page five of the lesson plan, nearest the um, part five, not part 5A. Okay. All right, where it says play video? Yes, play video. All right. And so when the video pauses, you would ask the students permission um, to position themselves at the side of their mannequins and tell them that they're going to um, be practicing the first rescue on the scene, checking for scene safety, and assessing the victim. In addition, they will practice adult compressions, completing three sets of 30 compressions. Mm -hmm. What I find as a new instructor is you're trying to teach everything at once. American Heart teaches in silos. So you cannot be talking about the AED and how to give breaths because this segment of the video does not cover that. The video does most of the teaching and then you can interject and add information I encourage our instructors to not overtalk. This video is perfect. So maybe you can interject for about one minute. And so with our instructors, I usually start it off. And so I'm going to do the same with you. Um, have you watched your video in its entirety? Hey, are you okay? Hey, are you okay? Are you okay? okay. Someone help. Someone help. Someone help. And it's just me, not you. Oh, just yeah. me. Okay. Okay, you go ahead. You looking at me. Can you see me? Yes. Activate the emergency response and get the AED. Activate emergency response and get the AED. One, two, three. What's wrong with my hand placement? Eight, nine. Oh, you have to move your. Twelve. You move have my to hand which way? Move your move your hand towards the head. Uh, just the head. Seven, Two, three, four. Then you have to repeat. Repeat after the. Nine, ten, oh, you want me counting too? Okay. Yeah, counting too. 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. Can you see the flashing lights? Yes. Okay, what's wrong with this? Four. And, okay. shadow. and I can't hear what number he's on. But that's how that segment would go. Okay. Okay. And most of your students will do exactly what I'm doing. When the segment ends, they just stand up and look at you. What would you like me to do now? Okay. Um, repeat what you said again. 
Your students will stand there until you give them instructions. Once the video stops, once the practice while watching ends, you can ask them to have a seat. All right. I'm going, to keep, I'm going to keep standing until you ask me to have a seat. Okay. Can you can you have a seat, please? Yes, I can. All right. All right. And so this would be a good time for you to assess what your students learned. So this is where I would ask the question, like, do you have any questions? Okay. Something that I find with the American Heart Association courses, which may distract a new student or a new BLS provider is that after three cycles, we stop and we sit down. Okay. What should happen in the real world? You continue. Continue for how many minutes? Continue for, is it, I think it says two minutes. Is that? Two minutes. How many cycles would that be? That would be, that would be 30 cycles. Mm -mm. It's no, 30 no. Uh huh? That's the compression. That's the compression. Three cycles. If you'll turn the camera back towards you, I'm sorry, so I can hear you. Okay. I know, right? We got a lot going on today, but you're doing this virtual <laughs> learning. I love it. I'm standing the okay? All right. This is the camera. Yes, sir. So you said um, two minutes. How many cycles of 30 compressions followed by two breaths will be complete in two minutes? You do that static compressions for two breaths. Mm -hmm. for and so that is five cycles in five two minutes. minutes. Five so cycles. How deeply do we compress? You compress two inches or, or five centimeters. Deep. What if you're on the bariatric unit and your patient is 600 pounds? You don't want to be compressing two inches. What's that other number? It's a fraction. One third. One third. One third. One yes. Okay. Yeah. So all sizes, if you don't remember the inches, let's right. say you have a person with a really, they're really large. You want to press that chest a third of the way in. Okay. And that's for all ages. Very important though, when you get to someone who's obese, we can't be compressing two inches and be effective. Okay. okay. So what is the purpose of allowing chest recoil? The purpose of allowing chest recoil is to be able to compress deep and uh, and then be able to compress deep. Oh, is that okay. That's the compression. What's the purpose of the recoil? Recoil is to allow allow uh, circulation. Yes. Complete circulation. Yes. Yes. And so, in layperson's terms, you're allowing the heart time to refill with blood. Because a lot of people want to get in there and just go really fast and they're not going to be effective. All right. Um, CAB is your priority when someone is in cardiac arrest. What does CAB stand for? So, and it's circulation, airway, and breathing. breathing yes. And so that's going to be hard for your, your, your older, mature medical professionals to remember because they've been focusing on airway, breathing, circulation, yeah. airway, breathing, circulation. But when someone's in cardiac arrest, it is circulation. And then when your team arrives, you can focus on airway and giving them those rescue breaths. If you're by yourself, your job is to compress, 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 compress. Okay. All right. And so the next video segment we're going to go through together is going to be the use of the AED. And okay. so in your instructor manual, because it's always as an instructor, Video is not your first priority. The video is for the students. Your priority is this manual. So if you turn to the AED section of your um, lesson plan. And so I've watched the video. And now this is the time to verify that I learned what I needed to learn. Mm -hmm. What is the first thing I do when the AED arrives on the scene? Open it immediately and turn it on. Okay, you say open it and do what else? I'm turning on immediately. Turn it on. Okay, so this is my AED device. I'm powering it on. Mm -hmm. Apply pads to patient's bare chest. Plug okay. in the next to okay. light. All right, and so 
The pads have a diagram, an illustration on them. Let the students pad. know which direction okay. they go. And so this one says stomach, and this one says nipple. Is this right? No, that's <laughs> right. It's not right. Yeah. So plug-in connector. High right. And on the left, on the left, uh, just yes. one. Okay, so does this look good to you? Apply pads. Okay. Insert connector firmly. It's telling me to insert the connector, so I'm going to do that now. Analyzing heart rhythm. Do not touch the patient. Everyone staying clear? Mm-hmm. And this is when charging it gets tricky advice. for American Heart Association. Charging. When it says charging, we go back and perform chest compressions. Deliver shock now. Press the orange button now. Clear again. And now that this is flashing. De shock delivered. And then we go back into our chest compressions. CPR. All right, so I want you to write this tone down. It's called a metronome. A metronome. You have a metronome. You need to know the name of this as an instructor. What is the purpose of this tone? You should be compressing to the tone that the AED makes. Okay. It helps to make sure that you're compressing at least 100 compressions per minute, that you're not going too slow or too fast. And if you look at this shoulder, if you compress with the metronome, you're going to get those two green lights. Okay. All AEDs that correspond with American Heart Association guidelines should have that tone. I'm turning this off for classroom purposes only. And I say that during every one of my classes because I don't know where my students are from. So if you'll please repeat after me, I am turning the AED off for classroom purposes only. I'm turning the AED off for classroom purposes only. Okay. When That's would your it. students turn their AED off in the real world? When, when should we turn it off? Uh -huh, in the real world. In the real world, if, if, the, if we stabilize the patient or if we send the patient to, if, the, if we transfer the patient out or we, we stabilize the patient or the patient is, is not um, breathing again. So this is what I tell the students in our classes, that um, we're pretty much going to keep the, the AED on. It's going to... So let's say a person um, goes into cardiac arrest in a home care setting. When the paramedics arrive, they're going to place their AED. And that AED is going to stay on until they get into the hospital. That's and when the hospital places the AED, that AED is going to stay on until that person is um, stabilized. Okay? So that could take surgery. That can take an hour, two hours. And so every two minutes, that machine is going to reanalyze. What should your compressor do every two minutes if they're still doing CPR? Compressor switches off. Okay. Every two minutes. And so when this analyzes, it's going to reanalyze every two minutes. Every that yes. is a reminder for your compressors to switch. And so what you see in the real world, you all are ACLS providers in the ICU. So when you switch, you're also checking a pulse. But for that person, that CNA, this is going to be determining whether or not the person has a pulse for them. And so even if it does say no shock advised, if there are no signs of life, you continue mm. CPR. Yeah. Why, would, why would this say no shock advised? What heart rhythm may have that, that what heart rhythm could that person may have gone into? What's uh, a non-shockable rhythm? Yeah, re regular rhythm. A regular rhythm, or they could be an asystole. Uh, yes, it's silly. One. So if there are no signs of life, we need to keep doing chest compressions. When mm -hmm. in doubt, do chest compressions. I'd rather someone does them who doesn't need them, then we actually delay those, those high-quality CPR measures. All right, we've learned a lot in this first hour. What questions do you have with me? That's too much. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you have a whole instructor manual there that's... that you... Yes, yes.
Uh, the, the one I'm interested, the one that you said that, uh, that what I wanted to find out is uh, your metronym. You, you talked about the metronym. Yes. No. So you, said it you said it correctly, yes. Yes, this is the one that gives you the ability to just to do the compression the way it, it is beeping. So beeping. most of your AEDs are, they have voice prompts. In right. addition to the voice prompts that talk you through it, they also have the metronome which if you follow the tone and you compress at the same pace as that tone, you're, you're going to be providing 100 up to 120 compressions per minute. So you won't go too slow and you won't go too fast. So it just helps you keep pace. Keep pace, okay. I hope my, I hope my have it when I'm- It does, when I'm it does, it does. I, I, I've used that one before, it does. So just practice with it. And if not, and the video is even going to talk, tell the students that they can download a metronome app and that metronome app that most of us use is called Pulse Point. Pulse Point. Pulse Point, yes. Okay. You can do download it on my cell phone. Yes, sir. Just yeah. remind your students that at no point does um, pressing that button on that app take priority over calling 911. I know. Okay. Right. So the American Heart Association has basic life support students or providers utilizing an AED as if it is a life pack, as if this is ACLS. So that can become very confusing to some students. If this, if they're not ever going to be in a team leader role, I really don't force them to use the AED the way that the American Heart Association has us using it as nurses. So if mm -hmm. I have a classroom full of CNAs, and they can follow the AED's prompts as given, I'm okay with that. But according to the video, when you watch it, there are, there are two times when we cannot touch the victim whenever we're using the AED. What are those two times? When is, um, when the, this is analyzing. Mm -hmm. And what's the other time? And the other one is, uh, remind me again, what is it again? I, I forgot the name. When you're pressing that button, when what are you when doing? You're when you're yeah, shocking. I'm shocking, yeah. Okay. So in the center, when it says charging, we can go back and deliver compressions. We are not hurting the victim. We're actually improving their chances of survival. And we're improving blood flow to the brain. So in my classes, if I'm seeing that a student's having a hard time with that concept, I know it's not their role because if they're ever a charge nurse, they won't be using an AED anyway. They're going to be using a life pack. They're going to be using a manual defibrillator. So, but just to recap, according to the American Heart Association, in your BLS classes, we're having them pretty much use an AED as if it is a manual defibrillator. Whenever it's analyzing, they're going to say clear. Yeah. When it says charging, we are going to bypass the prompts because the machine is going to say charging, do not touch the victim. When it says charging, we're going to say compress. And we're going to continue to allow that person to compress until the machine starts flashing. Your students are going to have a flickering finger. I move their fingers, no fingers hovering over the AED. You want to make sure everyone's clear because once it's, once it's flashing, make sure everyone's clear and then you can press the button. Press and, button. and then immediately after that, we resume high quality CPR and your machine will start beeping. What is the name of that beep? That beep, 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 beep. What's the name of it? That's metronome. Is it? That's the metronome. <laughs> <laughs> You ask me questions like <laughs> yes, and you want to do that in your classes. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. you're just talking. You're just talking, yeah. and no one's listening to you. Is, so exactly. I will, I will, I will make a statement and turn right back around and ask a question about the statement I just made. And some people are like, "I'm lost." <laughs> All right, so we're going to speed this up. The last segment is, that we're going to be doing together is going to be infant. Mm. Mm -hmm. Lesson eight. Lesson eight, okay. Infant DLS, which is pretty right. 
And if you would please read um, instructor tips, I want you to read this whole page to me because when the video plays this time, you're going to be critiquing me and using your checklist. Okay. Select a provider option to pay for this lesson in patient, in facility or pre-hospital. To review this lesson, students can refer to part six, BLS for infants and children, and part seven, automated external defibrillator for infants and children younger than eight years of age in the provider manual. Okay, all right, and so. Once the video pauses, what do you want to have the students do? Uh, ask students to position themselves at the side of, these, of their mannequins. Tell them that they will practice infant chest compressions and complete three sets of 80 compressions. Okay, and now I still want you to read the rest of the page, please. Okay. Practice while watching infant compressions. Before playing the video, tell students to follow along with the video and complete the steps for infant compressions. To tell, the, to tell students the following, place the infant on a firm, flat surface. Place two fingers in the center of the infant's chest, just below the nipple line on the lower half of the breastbone. If students prefer, they can use the two thumb and second hands technique. Do not press the tip of the breastbone. Push hard and fast at a depth of at least one third the depth of the chest, approximately one and a half inches, which is two, four centimeters. Deliver compressions at a rate of 100 to 120 per minute. If the student cannot achieve the recommended depth, you can tell the student that it may be reasonable to use the heel of one hand. So I want you to really, really think about that. We're not aiming for perfection. We're aiming for one and a half inches. Sometimes, especially if you're dealing with someone who works in construction or industrial areas, they could be missing some, some fingertips. So I'm not going to expect them to do this. Someone else could have arthritis. They may not be able to do this. Can they at least use the palm of their hand? And all of that is allowable. Okay? So it's not about perfection. It's about can you get that depth? How, and if you'll read the last one for me, please. Allow complete chest recoil after its compression without leaning on the chest between compressions. Okay, and let's turn to the next page. Minimize the interruptions. In compressions, trying to limit any interruptions in chest compression to less than 10 seconds. And then one more thing that I want to point out is even though we had skipped with the adults, eventually the adults was going to, the adult segment of the BLS video was going to have you practice with the, um, with the back, excuse me, practice with the, um, the pocket mask and the one-way bow. Um, you may or may not, depending on what video segment you have, you're, you're going to be playing with for your students have the one-way valve, excuse me, that's how tired I am, have the pocket mask with the one-way valve for the infant in your practice segment. And so a mm -hmm. student may ask about there or may question it. And you're, of course, you can let them practice with it, but what they're going to practice with instead is going to be the, the bag the mask bag device. Mask device. Okay? Because it's kind of like, hey, American Heart has shown that you have competence with the pocket mask. We kind of checked you off for that with adults. Same thing with the AED. Once you use it on the adult and you can demonstrate competence, if you can ask them about pad placement on an infant or a small child, center front and center back, but you don't have to keep going back and revisiting the AED, okay? Mm -hmm. And so for this segment, it may only have us do the compressions without the breaths, but at some point we will get to breath. We're just going to be using the back mask device. So as you learn your video, as you learn your book, Another recommendation I have for you is while the students are watching the video, I need you reading your book for whatever that segment is that you're playing. Okay. okay. All right. And so I am ready for you to find the infant in facility.
not free hospital, in facility segment, practice while watching. I want you to <laughs> turn, I want you to press the button on the baby's <laughs> iPhone. Okay. Okay. I need you to say it. I want you to turn the, the, the light on on the baby's diaper. Okay. Okay. Can you see my lights? Yes, I can see. Okay. All right. And so now if you'll press play on the video. All right. Okay, I'm going to have to turn to this. So then... In fact, compression. Okay. Let's go in three, two, one. Okay, you're watching me. One, two, three, three, four, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty. Unnecessary pause unless you are given breaths. My fingers hurt. Five. Six, seven, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty. Okay, now also six. acceptable. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Okay, now now sit down. You. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> you have to say it with love, sir. All right, students, you can sit down now. <laughs> yes. um, I'm still practicing. I'm still to know. <laughs> okay. All right. So, are you? Do you feel more comfortable going through your video and utilizing your instructor manual? Yes, I think. I think I'm beginning to understand how the process goes, how, how it goes, yes. I move this to the side, get my camera yes. closer. All right, so one of the last things that um, we had previously discussed was the actual examination. Right. All right, so Chucks, um, we're almost finished with our instructor development course for this evening. You have been a great student and a wonderful instructor. I know you're going to do well. As far as the instructor process, give me a takeaway. <laughs> something you learned, something that you're going to add. Well, this is, uh, this is a little bit challenging because uh, this is my first time going into instruction and being an instructor you know um what i what is what if i take away is to 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 give my best to give my best as an instructor to 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 teach to teach the course as if i'm in the real world as if yes. it's happening there, you know yes. because it will happen to anybody you know it's, and that's it's, so important um i don't most of our students um, I think we put a lot of pressure on ourselves. Right. Our students are happy to be able to get a certification, to be able to go to work, um, to know that they know somebody within the community who can provide the, the services, the class that they need. And so you're going to get better with time. And what's going to help you improve is you have to know your materials like the back of your hand. And right. so I'm, I'm, I'm happy that I was able to go through, you know, just portions of the instructor manual with you and then help you understand how to utilize your equipment, what you should be looking for, feedback versus debriefing. And um, I know that you're going to do well. Okay, so good luck to you and your business. And I'm always here as a resource. If you need anything, just send me an email or a text message. And I'm going to be ending the recording, but I'll still be back because we have one more part that we need to discuss, okay?